Hi, I'm Rob Dismond, and I'm the owner of your local Domino's Slippery Rock. I started out with Domino's as a delivery driver when I was in college, ended up really liking the job, worked my way up through management to the supervisor. I did that for about 10 years. My family, we decided that we couldn't really go any further with that, so we decided to go ahead and become a franchisee with Domino's. I'm lucky enough to have enough community support that most customers have become more than just customers, they're more like friends. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this community for 20 years, and I look forward to many more years. Welcome back to Real Reviews from the Rock. I'm Aaron. I'm James. And today we're going to be watching the 1937 classic A Star is Born. Now James, there's a few different versions of this movie, right? Yeah, there's the uh, version we're watching, which is, uh, you know, 1937. There is the 1954 version with uh, Judy Garland. And uh, there is the 1976 version with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. And the 2019 uh, with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. So there's uh, a multitude of versions of A Star is Born. Cool. Um, so who stars in this one? Uh, so this one is uh, Frederick March and uh, Janet Gaynor. Um, both uh, great uh, uh, actors uh, in their own way. This is actually Janet Gaynor's only Technicolor film. Mm. Um, yeah, this is her only Technicolor film, and uh, you know, as for Frederick March, I mean, he has been in a multitude of films by this point, and uh, he goes on to have just a very successful career. Um, in fact, he was looked up to uh, by several of uh, Hollywood's uh, giants. Uh, so, for example, Spencer Tracy, who uh, was going to be in Twenty Thousand Years, who was in Twenty Thousand Years of Sing Sing. Sing which I know you guys uh, were going to do last semester. Um, he is, in my opinion, probably one of the greatest actors of all time and is recognized and has been recognized by you know, current stars and stars of the past. Um, he looked up to Frederick March uh, a lot uh, oh. as an inspiration, um, especially when they worked together on Inherit the Wind in 1954 together. God speaks to you? Yes. He tells you what is right and wrong? Yes. And you act accordingly? Yes. So you, Matthew Harris and Brady, through oratory or legislature or whatever, you pass on God's orders to the rest of the world. Well, meet the prophet from Nebraska. Would you uh, mind giving the audience a quick synopsis uh, before we jump right into the film? Yeah, sure. Uh, so basically, a Star is Born is about a young wannabe actress who moves to L.A. to hope to make it big, and she kind of falls in with an actor who's kind of on his way out, and they fall in love, and her career starts, and kind of overshadowing each other in ways, and I'd say it doesn't end exactly the happiest, but... yeah. It's a yeah. good story. No, yeah, it is. Uh, it's a very good story, and it's a simple build mm -hmm. for films. Uh, you know, there is always a balancing act between, you know, uh, two main characters, such as in A Star is Born, and you see it in a lot of films, whether they be comedies or, or dramas. Uh, and I think, you know, Frederick March and Janet Gaynor uh, were just perfect in their casting together for this film. Um, and the same could be said for every iteration. I mean, honestly, every iteration. Uh, 
would have been perfect. Um, you know, what I think would have been more exciting, you know, had it happened was uh, for the 1976 film, uh, Chris Christopherson was not the first choice to uh, to be in the film. In fact, it was supposed to be Elvis Presley uh, mm. with Barbara Streisand. Uh, however, you know, he, Elvis wasn't really into getting ac back into his act uh, into his film career. Um, as where his manager would have liked to have seen him in the movie. The only issue was, you know, Elvis had a very successful film career. I mean, when he left in 1969, uh, when he left Hollywood to go back to singing, uh, he left on the top. And, you know, he just had hit after hit after hit because audiences, you know, would go out in droves to see him. Uh, and it, it didn't even matter if the film was bad. I mean, if Elvis was in it, I mean, it made money. Yeah. Um, so... The manager didn't want to see him in a film where his film career was diminished because it just was the exact opposite of who Elvis Presley was. Uh, but that would have been interesting, in my opinion, to have seen that version of the film. Yeah, that would have been cool. So, yeah, let's jump into the film, grab your snacks, grab a drink, and let's enjoy 1937's A Star is Born, starring Frederick March and Janet Gaynor. Hi, I'm Rob Disman, and I'm the owner of your local Domino's Slippery Rock. I started out with Domino's as a delivery driver when I was in college. Ended up really liking the job. Worked my way up through management to the supervisor. I did that for about 10 years. My family, we decided that we couldn't really go any further with that, so we decided to go ahead and become a franchisee with Domino's. I'm lucky enough to have enough community support that most customers have become more than just customers, they're more like friends. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this community for 20 years, and I look forward to many more years. tonight. Mm, lovely. Mice, that's what it was. Just a lot of mice. There wasn't anybody killed the whole thing. No, well, then I'll stick to these. These don't talk. And that big cluck Norman Maine was in the picture tonight. Never does anything but kiss a lot of girls. Norman Maine is one of the best actors in pictures. You and your movies, that's all you think about. You shouldn't be allowed to go to him at all if you're asking me. Too bad I was so busy in the kitchen. I didn't hear anybody asking you. Hello, Granny. Hello, darling. But of course, no one ever listens to me. They do if they're within 10 miles of you. Gathering around picture shows. House all cut it up with movie magazines. And the other day, I caught her talking to a horse with a Swedish accent. Oh, sis. We're only young once, you know. Ah. Hollywood. You'd better be getting yourself a good husband and stop mooning about Hollywood. Do you know what she wants to do? She wants to go to Hollywood. I've known it all along. I've seen her making faces in the mirror and talking to herself. That's what comes of your movies. Why, what would you do if you did go to Hollywood? I'd be an actress. <laughs> I would, I tell you, I've always known I could. 
Guys, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a movie star in the family? Oh, Miss Blanchett, may I hand you your autograph? You may not know it, darling, but you're practically on your way to bed. Oh, Miss Blanchett, you're my favorite actress. Won't you tell me the secret of your success? Oh, let me alone. I asked her what's come over you. I'll tell you what's come over her. She's just a silly little girl whose head has been turned by the movies. And the sooner she forgets the whole thing, the better off she'll be. Why will I be better off? What's wrong with wanting to get out and make something of myself? What do you do that's so much better? Just because you're satisfied to sit here all your life, you think you can laugh at me. Well, someday you won't laugh at me. I'm going out and have a real life. I'm going to be somebody. Now, if it was spring, I'd say give her a good dose of sulfur and molasses. Find you. Oh, stop that. Now, stop crying. That isn't going to do you a bit good. Oh, I'm crying because Aunt Maddie and Alec make me so mad. Well, Alec like and Aunt Maddie. Fiddlesticks. They're not important. You're the only one that counts. Esther, everyone in this world who has ever dreamed about better things has been laughed at. Don't you know that? Oh, I suppose I do, but... But there's a difference between dreaming and doing. The dreamers just sit around and moon about how wonderful it would be if only things were different. And the years roll on and they grow old. And by and by they forget everything, even about their dreams. Oh, I don't want to be like that. I want to be somebody. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You want to be somebody. But you want it to be easy. Oh, you modern girls, give me that. When I wanted something better, I came across those planes in a prairie schooner with your grandfather. Oh, everyone laughed at this. They did it all the other pioneers. They said this country would never be anything but a wilderness. We didn't believe that. We were going to make a new country. Besides, we wanted to see our dreams come true. Oh, Granny, it must have been wonderful. It was wonderful. But don't you think for one single minute that it was easy, Esther Blodgett? We burned in summer and we froze in winter. But we kept right on going and we didn't complain because we were doing what we wanted to do. Can you understand that? Yes, I can. Could you do it? Could you do it even if it broke your heart? Because remember, Esther, for every dream of yours you may come true, you'll pay the price in heartbreak. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. You may not believe it, but I was a young girl once. And a very pretty young girl. A lot prettier than you are. And I was in love with your grandfather. And when some Indian devil put a bullet through him, that is as if it had gone right straight through my heart, too. But I remembered all he taught me, and I went right on. I buried him out there on that wilderness with my own hands. And I went right on that same day. And I kept right on going, even when your mother was born. Oh, Granny, I want to make it worthwhile. <laughs> you know, Esther, there'll always be a wilderness to conquer. Maybe Hollywood's your wilderness now. From all I hear, it sounds like it. But if you've got one drop of my blood in your veins, you won't let Mattie or any of her kind break your heart. You'll go right out there and break it yourself. That's your right. Here. Oh, here, here. Stop that nonsense. Here. Take this and go to your Hollywood. Oh, I can't take your money. Well, why not? But you're saving. Well, I was only saving up for my funeral. Now I don't think I'm ever going to die. Oh, Granny, how can I ever thank you? By giving me your word of honor that you'll never tell a living soul where you got that money. I promise. Remember, if you do, I'll have you arrested for robbing me. I've waited for that chance for 30 years. 
Or month. Well, it's a little hard to say. You see, I'm going into the movies. Well, you better take it for a week. It'll break your jump to Beverly Hills. Are all the studios really near here? All except Gaumont British. I suppose the best way to get a job is to go straight to the studios, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I have many illusions, you know. I'm perfectly willing to begin with oh, a little bit of a part, or even as an extra. Six dollars, please, in advance. Oh. you been in Hollywood? Well, it's about a month now. We haven't put anyone on our books for over two years. Come here. I'd like to show you something. Casting. 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 Cas
Every time you see one of those little lights flash, it's somebody asking for a job. Every time you hear them say, try later, it means there isn't any job. You can't keep the girls at the switchboard long. They go crazy. Every one of those little lights thought it was going to be a star. Still want to go in the movies? You know what your chances are? One in a hundred thousand. But maybe I'm that one. Any phone calls for me, Mr. Randall? Oh, no. Jesse Lasky and Sammy Goldman must be writing letters instead. How's the luck today? Mm, there wasn't any. Maybe you don't go at it in the right way. Now, take Danny McGuire here. He knows the ropes, uh, don't you, Danny? Sure, I've had him around my neck for years. Huh? What? Oh, uh, Miss Blodgett, Danny McGuire, our new tenant. How do you do? Mr. McGuire is a big director. Oh, are you really? Oh, could you possibly use me in a picture, Mr. McGuire? Of course, I haven't had much experience, but I don't think that really matters if you're willing. And now I really listen, feel lady. That... In the first place, I'm not a director. I'm an assistant director. In the second place, if I had any jobs to give away, I'd confer one on myself. And in the third place, you should have stayed back home in the first place. Oh, no, look what you've done. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, don't be that way. Don't do that. Gosh, I didn't mean to get tough, but a guy thinks he's being kidded when somebody asks him for a job and... He hasn't got one for himself. After all, I'm not a big enough shot to hurt your feelings. I, I'm sorry. It wasn't just that. It was a lot of things. Looking for a job every day and never getting any nearer to it. I guess I was beginning to get a little scared. I know. Lady, do I know. Well, there's only one thing to do for that feeling when you're tired and sunk and down to your last nickel. Come on and I'll buy you a drink. Well, it's not as bad as down to the last nickel. But I still got eleven dollars left. Eleven dollars? You're gonna buy me a drink. Come on. That's right, George. There's nothing like a little rum to take away that milk flavor. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> and when I sign my contract, the first thing I'm going to do is see that you direct every picture I'm in. That's my pal. Of course, I'm going to be perfectly nice about it, but I'll just insist. Now, that's the way to talk. Don't let them lick you. Oh, I should say they can't lick me. If they try anything like that, what? Now that's right. What have you got to lose? Another one of these and we'll open our own studio. Bill rendered $24. Pass two. Remit without further delay. Me.
hey, the program's going to be swell tonight. Now, you take this fella Beethoven. I'm a pushover for him. And Chopin, well, he's not so dusty either. But I kind of wish that once in a while they'd play something you could sort of go out whistling, you know, like, blood on the saddle, blood on. Well, there's a tune. Hey, why don't you throw your hat in the air or something, can't you? This is a celebration. My job starts tomorrow. And I know it does, and I think it's swell, Danny. Gee, I wish you were in on it, too. But, oh, no, it would have to be a war picture. One of those big novelty numbers. A war picture without any beautiful women at the front. Oh, well, something will happen soon. Maybe. Why don't you go home, kid? Oh, Danny, I can't do that. I came here and I've got to stay. Well, now, if it's on account of money, I can only... Thank you. You've given me enough already. Anyhow, this is no time to be worrying. This is a party. <laughs> Look at all the people. Everybody in the world. Me and, me. Uh, and he seems to have had that one extra cocktail. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sit down, you dope. That's the orchestra leader. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. May, Mr. May, put your arm around Miss Regis. Oh, no, this is a Hollywood ball. Oh, afraid of crowds. What's going on? Do I get out of here? What's the matter? You're getting too big to bother with photographers? Don't want any pictures taken now. Oh, is that so? What's a person I take it anyway? Well, oh, shove that bomb number two of yours down your throat. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Man. No, 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 Is he always like that? Well, I suppose he has to sleep sometime. Oh, and he's so wonderful on the screen. You see, it's not really a picture job. It's, it's, well, it's being a waitress. Oh. Um, well, it's kind of a picture job if you look at it right. You said it was a waitress. Well, it's waitressing for Casey Burke, the big director over at our studio. He's given a party tonight to kind of celebrate on account of finishing the picture. And, and he wanted me to get him an extra waitress, and it's $5. And I thought of you right away, Esther. That was awfully sweet of you, Danny. Well, well, there's going to be a lot of big people at Burke's house tonight, and I'll bet you there's any number of big directors. And if you're there, maybe they'll notice you. I could make them notice me. Sure you could, Esther. It's your chance. My chance. All right, Danny, I'll do it. Oh. Oh, but I can't. I haven't got the right things to wear. Oh, oh, yes. Now, you don't think the wardrobe department's right next to my office for nothing, do you? <laughs> A perfect fit. Did 
Did you get to the preview last night? I did. Would you like a lethal order? They are very nice. Oh, thanks. But what did you think of the picture? They should have saved it for Thanksgiving. What a turkey. Oh. <laughs> Will you have some hors d'oeuvre? You do like hors d'oeuvre, don't you? I don't think there's anything so enjoyable as hors d'oeuvre before supper. And these are really delightful. And at the finish, the kid turns around and sings the lullaby to its mother. Uh, pardon the big boys, but would you like a little uh, order? Uh, they say they're the best in town. Don't tell me. I know, Mae West. That's a great twist. But where are you going to find a two-month-old baby that can sing? <laughs> hello, Oliver. Oh, hello, Casey. You want to fire me now? Wait till you see the picture. I'm not a director anymore, I'm a, a male nurse. What's the matter with the picture? A guy by the name of Norman May. His work is beginning to interfere with his drinking. Oliver, don't tell me I'm to direct his next picture too. Mm-hmm. You were my favorite producer. Uh, now, wait a minute. You just go right on with your directing. I'll take care of these stars. I know how to handle them. I had a serious talk with Norman after that uh, Hollywood Bowl occurrence. And you don't have to worry any more about his behavior. Excuse me, Mr. Niles. Mr. Libby of your publicity department is on the telephone. He says it's most important, sir. It's about Mr. Mean. Thank you. Oh, it's probably just some little thing. <laughs> of course, Arthur. I'll turn on the radio and see if they've called out the National Guard yet. Hello, Libby. What's the good word? Mr. Norman Maine, America's Prince Charming was apprehended driving an ambulance down Wilshire Boulevard with a siren going full blast. He explained he was a tree surgeon on a maternity case. Well, uh, will it be in the papers? No, it won't be in the papers. But that's a nice, expensive hobby of yours, keeping Mr. Maine's informal entertainments out of the public press. Oh, that's fine work, Libby. Uh, try and see that no one gets to Norman. He's probably home sleeping at all. All of them. Yeah. Why can't you forget those dopes at the studio for one night? Business, business, all the time. I don't know what's going to become of you. Norman! Why didn't you call for me? Well, by darling, why didn't I call for you? In case you've forgotten, I was supposed to come here with you. Oh, that, oh, that's all right. I got here without any trouble. The only reason I don't slap your face. Yes, yes darling, I, I know. <laughs> hello, John. Oh, hello, man. What's the matter with Oliver? He looks as if he'd had bad news. Hello. Hello, Mary. Hmm? What's the matter, old boy? Maybe I'm wrong. I guess I've been drinking too much lately. Oh, you ought to cut it down. It's bad stuff. Scotch and soda. Come on, come on, come on. The word, you know, is pronounced when. Bad dialogue, Oliver. You'd rather not watch this. You know best. Soda. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead and say it. I've got a comment to him. Don't make it tougher on me, Norman. I don't want to stand here and preach. But take a look at my side of it. I'm trying to make pictures yeah, with you. I know, I know. Costs are going up and the grosses are going down. No, it isn't that. I've made lots of money with you. And I can afford to take a loss. But I hate to see you going the way of so many others. Why don't you get Lloyds to insure you against me? You can't get insurance against a man forgetting who he is. You're a great star, Norman, but there's nobody so big that he can afford to have people refuse to work with him. Who doesn't want to work with me? You Shh, quiet. Listen, I know plenty of people who do. Yes, and so do I. But your real friends can't stand seeing you start to fall apart. What do you mean by that? The first signs are always the same. Not being able to remember your lines. Cameraman struggling to cover your hangovers. And all because you have to have a good time. Every day and every night. Listen, I've warned you for a long time. Okay, Norman. Oliver, you're a swell guy. You won't lose any money on me. I promise you that. I'll be ready for the curtains when the time comes. When it does, here's my epitaph. And now I think I'll um, have a little drink. 
scotch and soda. Scotch and soda. Uh, pardon me. Oh, lovely, lovely. No, I mean the caviar. Mm -hmm. No, don't, don't go away. I'm, I'm starving. Huh? Really? Which, which would you take? Well, I don't know. If you know? Oh, I, I don't know either. It's hard to choose. Well, I think I'll take caviar. Mr. Maine doesn't care for any more. Do you know me? No. No, well, Normie doesn't care for any more. I think I shall get very drunk indeed. Scotch and soap. <laughs> Sorry, I have something. Mind if I help? Won't they miss you? Oh, no, no. They'll just look under the table, and when they see I'm not there, they'll forget the whole matter. <laughs> well, what, uh, what, what's your name? Esther Blodgett. My name's Maine. I know. You do? Ah. <laughs> what, what's so funny? I was just thinking about all your fans and how surprised they'd be to see you here helping me put plates away. Oh, they, they don't know my finer side. <laughs> You'd be pretty envious of me, meeting you this way in person. Oh, you do. Well, tell me, are, uh, are, are you disappointed? Yes. Oh, now you've done it. Oh, never mind that. That makes the room look lived in. Tell me, uh, boy. Why, why are you disappointed? I was sitting behind you at the Hollywood Bowl the night you didn't want to be photographed. Yeah. I'm told I crept into many a heart that night. Oh, I can never explain this. You know, you have very pretty hair. You better get out of here. And a sensitive mouth and a charming little girl. Precisely why are you here instead of with the rest of the guests? Well, I'm just trying to be helpful. I, I see. Are you sure there's no other attraction? Well, it might be that my old mania for putting plates away is coming back on me. It's rather odd. I always know where I can find you, if there's a pretty girl around. It's not only odd, it's embarrassing. You're being deliberately insulting, Norman. I put up no, 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 long no, enough. No, don't lose your temper. Remember, we must try to keep the voice low. I know you'll excuse us if we go on with our work. you're going to say now. What? Good night. Good night and thanks. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, uh, you realize that all I found out about you is that you were foolish enough to want to go into pictures? But why is it foolish? Look at you. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, I'd, uh, I'd rather like to go into this matter a little more thoroughly. Oh, that's awfully nice of you. Uh, why, uh, why don't we uh, go on up to my place and uh, talk it over? Oh, no. Thank you very much, but I really must say good night. Good night. Good night. 
hungry. You're not angry. No, no. I'm hungry. Well, why don't you go and get something to eat? Good night, Miss Blodgett. Good night, Mr. Maine. Wait a minute. Peter, the least I can do is to see you to your door. Will I see you again? Has anyone ever told you that you're lovely? Well, now you know. Thank you. This, uh... It's hard to say, but I... I want to say it anyway. You know, I'm a... I'm a screen. I'm a... You know... In private life, I'm a... <laughs> you know... But whatever I do, I, I still respect lovely things. And you're lovely. You understand? Yes, I, I think I do. And it, it isn't that bump on the head that's doing this. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Good night. Quite impossible. I wouldn't even consider it. No, no, no. Hello? Who is it? Who? Norman? What have you done now? You're not in jail, are you? I see. Oh, it's that again. I see. She's beautiful. Yeah, I know. You want me to give her a screen test? Yeah, certainly. She's got wonderful possibilities. Oh, you know she's got something. Well, you knew all the other ones had something, too. Oh, no. I tell you, Oliver, she's got that sincerity and, and honestness and a... Uh, Sin uh, sincerity and honestness that uh, that makes great actresses. You, Oliver, I am so sure of this girl that I want to take the test with her myself. <sighs> Listen, Oliver, you've worked hard. You're entitled to a break. You get. <whistles> yes, I heard you. Anything, anything. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oliver, look. You, you try to get a little steep now, old man. You... All right. All right, boy. Good, good night.
telephone. For me? Some drunk trying to be funny says he's Norman Maine. Oh. oh, oh, thanks, I'll be right down. And Miss Blodgett, would you give him a message for me? Tell him it's three o'clock in the morning! I'm going to take a test tomorrow, and Norman Maine's helping me do it. Mm, I'm taking one, too. Garble's assisting me. through this. Harlow, Lombard, Myrna Loy, and now Esther Blodgett. All right. I'm ready. This is a take. Roll them. Quiet. Hey. I may as well tell you that my whole organization thinks I've gone a little nuts to sign you. Well, maybe they're right. I've been nuts before. You see, all the experts seem to think that your type is a little mild for present-day taste. But I rather believe that tastes change, like eyebrows. And I think that also like eyebrows, tastes are going back to the natural. You look like a nice girl. I think I'm going to like you. That's not important. I think the public will like you. That is important. Oh, yes. I see what you mean. I, I mean, I know it is. Well, you don't think it's going to be easy. Nothing you really want is ever given away free. You have to pay for it. And usually with your heart. Someone else told me that once. But you still have to work it out for yourself. Oh, well, all this is just a long way of saying, I'm glad you're with us and good luck to you. And now I'm going to turn you over to our demon press agent, Libby. Don't let him frighten you. He has a heart of gold, only harder. And for the love of Pete, learn to close your mouth and keep it closed even in your love scenes. Are you a Russian? No, I was born in Fillmore, North Dakota. Oh, no. 
Trace saw a light of day in a mountain cabin, a trapper's hut, high up in the Rockies. Go on. Well, I always wanted to be an actor. Dreamed of footlights as Lonely Kitty. Are you sure there's no Russian in your family? Positive. That's a shame. Well, what does your father do? He's a farmer. Yeah. Social registered father. Fed up with hypocrisies of 400, sought wilderness for consolation. There, amidst the mountain flowers, he raised another blossom. His lovely little daughter. What's your name? Esther Victoria Blanchett. Greatly appreciating your attention in this matter, very truly. Do you know what her name is? Esther Victoria Blodgett. He will have to do something about that right away. Esther Victoria Blodgett. Well, that Blodgett's definitely out. Let's see. Uh, Esther Victoria, Victoria. Vicky, how about Vicky? Oh, I think that's terribly cute. Let's see, Vicky. Vicky what? Vicky, Vicky. Pronounced Vicky, Vicky. Siesta, besta, sesta, desta, festa. Oh, that's very pretty. Jester, hester, desta, lester. Vicky Lester. Oh, I like that. Say it. Vicky Lester. Say it again. Vicky Lester. Say it again. Vicky Lester. Say it. Vicky Lester. Say Vicky Lester. Vicky Lester. Vicky Lester. Vicky Lester. Vicky Lester. Vicky Lester. Flash. Oliver Nile Studio discovers new starlet, a Cinderella of the Rockies. Her name is Vicky Lester. Those who have peaked tell me she couldn't be more devoon. The face of an angel and such natural talents. Her voice is a symphony. Her very walk, they tell me, is enough to drive men mad. Not that way. Get the lead out of your feet. Lift them up. That's better. It's terrible, but it's better. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. Cease. Through the mouth, my child, through the mouth. The nose is for smelling roses. <laughs> Proceed. Does she have to look surprised all the time? Anyway, it's just a rough sketch. Pretty small mouth, eh? Oh, well. Give her that Crawford smear. <laughs> this will give her that deep mm -hmm. We're on the wrong track. She still looks surprised. Let them drop, people. We're shooting on the set this morning, not in the commissary. Now come on, snap into it. Acme Trucking Company. No, uh, Mr. Smith is not in. Acme Trucking Company. Uh, no, uh, Mr. Smith is not in. Good morning. What can I bring you, Mr. Maine? That just shows how long you've been here. Mabel, bless you. How soon are you and I going to be married, huh? I don't know. You'll have to ask my mother. Trucking company. Uh, no, uh, Mr. Smythe is not in. Acme Trucking Company. Uh, no, uh, Mr. Uh, Smith is not in. Acme? No, Smith ain't in. Me 
Martin and Company. I'd like to speak to Mr. Smith, please. Mr. Smith is not... Oh, Norman. What's all this between you and Smith? Cut that apart. It's only one line, but it's in the picture. So it's ambition that made you break that date with me last night. Well, I had to be here so early this morning and... Uh, so did I. I had to stay up all night to make it. You started your picture, haven't you? No, no, we're still in the testing stage. You can't seem to get the right girl for the lead. Gee, you think with all the girls there are that... Yeah, I know, but this one's got to be different. She's got to be little and cute and sweet and intelligent. Or blow me down. What? Or close my tired old eyes. Well, what is it? Hold everything, come on. Come on. Had you been through the whole casting directory? I'll work day and night, Mr. Niles. And I'll work with her, Oliver. And I can be mean or nasty or anything you want, Mr. Niles. If she clicks, Oliver, you've got a star overnight. Okay. By no one. They're much too busy playing at croquet. I've loved you all my life. But we only met two days ago. That's when my life began. Vicky left this picture all right. I think she was much better than he was. These producers are so horribly dumb. They won't know how good she is. Well, maybe it's because she's a good girl. No oh, means that's so bad, but it's Vicky Lester they'll go to see. Vicky, darling, I think she's the most precious little thing I've ever seen. The knockout, Libby. You might mention that when you write your review. That Lester kid's a gold mine. Didn't you like Norman Maine? Was he in it? <laughs> Libby? I'm afraid we have another hit. Huh? It's in the bag. Neatly tied up with beautiful pink ribbons. Hey, where are Norman and Vicky? I don't know. I thought you had them. I wish they'd come. We're having a party at the Trocadero. Isn't it thrilling running away from people? Norman, it's so exciting. So, so new. A star is born. Come on, son. Wonderful, isn't it? Crazy quilt. Oh, it's a carpet that's spread for you. It's all yours from now on, you know? Come, Esther. You're a success. You have everything in the world you want. I hope it'll make you happy. Hasn't it you? Then there was one thing I never had. Lots of times I told myself I'd found it, but I always knew I was lying. So I, I never stopped looking for it. Maybe it'll come. Well, I think it has come, Esther. I only wish it weren't too late. Oh, but it's not too late. Oh, you can't throw away your life the way I've thrown away mine and have anything left that's good enough. No. You can't. Norman, you can. 
You mustn't tell me that, Esther. I'm so afraid that I'll believe it. I didn't read that line right. I'll try it again. We are going to be married. Both of us. Yeah, to each other. What do you think of that? Well, when? Where? Well, we uh, thought we'd elope in the conventional manner. What's the matter? It's trying to decide whether it's good for the studio. Is it? It is. And bless you, my children. When's it going to happen? Oh, we thought we'd just sneak out sometime. We're not telling anyone but you. Listen to this. The screen's ideal romance blossomed into breathtaking reality today when Vicki Lester and Norman Maine, America's dream lovers, slipped quietly through the portals of holy matrimony. How does it sound? Horrible. But you see, we're going to elope. Sure you are. It'll be the biggest elopement this town ever saw. We'll get a tie-up with the Army, have you escorted all the way down to Yuma by 20 of their new bombing planes. Is he going with us? Don't you think we can work this thing out better alone? No sense in bothering the happy couple with all the details. I'll see to it that you get a carbon copy of the whole layout. I can hardly wait. I'm uh, sorry we didn't realize that we were in the way. By your settling the details, you don't mind if I take this woman out and buy her a ring? Do sure, you? go ahead. We want everything legal. That's a charming match. A nice girl like Vicky. And public nuisance number one. Now, wait a minute, Libby. Norman's all right. And if you'll pardon my pointing, Vicky's business is her own. It doesn't require any comments. I wasn't making any comments. I just said it was a rotten shame. So go ahead and plan the elopement. Oh, that elopement stuff is out. You can't get any scope in that. We're going to have a wedding. Well, we have it. Customary place, I believe, is a church. Nah, it's been done. This has got to be something big. The beach. I can visualize it. The bridesmaids in bathing suits. 20,000 Santa Monica school children spelling out the word love. It's a novelty, but is it big enough? Why not the city hall? A police escort of every motorcycle cup in town. Sirens screaming, confetti pouring out of buildings like the Lindbergh reception in New York, only on a big scale. What's the matter? Isn't it big enough? And now, if any man can show just cause why these two may not be lawfully joined together, let him now speak or else hereafter forever hold his peace. Do you, Alfred Henkel, take this woman as your lawful wedded wife? Will you love, comfort, honor, and keep her in sickness and health as long as you both shall live? I will. Do you, I beg your pardon. Do you, uh, Esther Blodgett, take this man as your lawful wedded husband? Will you obey, serve, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and health as long as you both shall live? I will. Place the ring on her finger. Uh -huh. uh, hurry, please. Uh -huh. Now, by virtue of the power invested in me as Justice of the Peace of San Bardo Township, County of Los Angeles, 
I pronounce you man and wife. And now, I must exercise my prerogative of office. <laughs> I hope you'll be very happy, Mrs. Hinkle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, Danny. Thank you very much. Now, if you'll please sign the license. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, Mrs. Hinkle, I can't help but believe I've seen you somewhere before. Oh, really? Well, uh, I believe this is the first time I've ever been in San Vardo. You know, your face is familiar, too, really? Mr. Hinkle. There you I are, want... sir. Thank you very much. Oh, Here's your thank receipt. You, sir. Thank you. Good goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. See you again. Yes, goodbye. No, I don't know me now, see. See, I think you got by with it. But it was close. That J.P. was just beginning to remember where he'd seen it. Well, anyway, we got away from Libby. Hello, good. If you will be kind enough to glance between my shoulder blades, Mr. and Mrs. Henkel, you will find there a knife buried to the hilt. On the handle are your initials. Let me do a senior, Libby. Hold it, wait. Hold it, Danny. There go a couple of rats I raised from mice. Well, they got a right to get married, haven't they? I haven't got any right to double cross the public. And I haven't done it yet. Hey! People versus Porky Washington. We're charged with violating Section 600. Young man, you're in contempt of court. Operator, get me the Los Angeles Tribune. I have a good mind to put you under arrest. Where did I make the score? You wait, too. Tribune, give me the city desk. Johnny, this is Matt Libby. I got a flash for you. Norman Maine and Vicki Lester were married at 2.30 this afternoon. Vicki Lester? Court recess! Stripped the gear. Well, sit down, won't you, and let's get acquainted. We'll probably be seeing quite a bit of each other from now on. Mm -hmm. Might just as well break the ice now as later. Mm. Now we're old friends. <laughs> hey, have I have I got time for a shower before dinner? Plenty, if you can find a shower. I never can remember where that thing is. Does it uh Pull out or slide under? Here, I think I can find it. Nope, it's the linen closet. Here it is. Nice work. Oh, half the time those things are just luck. I'll see if I can disinfect this steak. Hey, Esther, uh, there's no soap. Here. I'll need a washcloth, please. Oh. How you fix the cigarette? You know I never smoke underwater. Well, what, what do I do to make this thing work? Pull that gadget at the top and pray for rain. Well, I, I can't reach it. I can't, I can't get my hands up. 
If you've gone in there with your arms down, you'll never get your back. Unless you're a contortionist. Yeah, well, I, I'm not a contortionist. And don't throw that up to me now. You, you knew it when you married me. Will you close this door, please? Thank you. You guess it. Uh, can you get us some help? Well, I reckon not. You know, it's a long way to town. We're pretty busy down at the place. Well, I gotta get out of here. I've, I've got my wife with me. Don't she like the country? No. No, and then we're short of food. There's a lot of game in them woods. You know, well, my wife can't shoot. Well, you're sure up against it. Sorry I can't do anything for you. Well, wait, listen, I'll, I'll be frank with you. I'm Norman Maine. Who? Norman Maine. Well, my name is Judd Baker. Glad to have met you. Well, so long. Hey, wait a minute. Listen, you don't... So you're Norman Maine. I got my prestige to look out for. I'm supposed to be the best publicity man in the racket. And they laugh themselves sick when I even try to get a decent mention of Maine. Yes, I know how sensitive you are, Libby, and I don't like to see your feelings hurt. Thanks, boss. Now, Vicky, there's a dish for free space. But if Maine swam across the Pacific, the papers would keep it a secret. Well, the exhibitors don't like him, the critics don't like him, the public don't like him, and I don't like him. Who likes him? Darling, this is almost too much of a surprise. And there I was in my touching innocence, thinking we were going to live at the beach house. Oh, we'll still keep the place at Malibu. But this is special. This is our castle. It used to be in the air, you know? Well, we'll never use any ugly words like contracts and pictures and careers. When we come in those gates, we'll check the studio outside. Come on, I got another little surprise for you. Lovely. So are you lovely. The whole world's lovely. Hey, hold it! That's it. Caption, their honeymoon never ends. All right, let's get some pictures. Now, if the bride will sit here and the groom stand behind her, we'll have something unique. Now let's go after something different. You sit down and she'll stand up. Pretty radical, isn't it? Yeah, but in a nice way. Uh. Okay, I don't fire. Caption, their honeymoon begins anew. Ah, the producer. Caption, their honeymoon ceases abruptly. Hello, Oliver, glad to see you. Oh, I'm glad you're back. Thank you. Vicky, how well you're looking. Hello, Oliver. Am I interrupting? Yes, thank you. Just want a couple more pictures. That's enough of both of them. What they're asking for is exclusives of Miss Lester. Alone. Oh, I see. Well, come on, Oliver. Let you and me get exclusive. See you later, Vicky. Well, don't worry, Otto. My camera smashing days are over. Yeah. They ain't your only days that are over. Oh, hold that, Miss Lester. Gorgeous. Well, Oliver? How's the dividend situation? Very pleasant. I think we'll show two million on the next quarter. Oh, <laughs> Smart move of mine to sell my stock, eh? Oh, well, when you need money, you need it. Well, some people save up for just such an event. <laughs> it's bound to be a rainy day occasionally. Yeah, but as a citizen of California, I've always refused to admit that. <laughs> yes, I know, but still it does rain. Well, anyway, you can thank me for some of those dividends of yours. Mm-hmm. Oh, can't you? Oh, sure, sure. 
That was a little too quick, Oliver. Matter of the Enchanted Hour was a smash hit, wasn't it? Well, it uh, made Vicky a star overnight. Yes, it should have. What about me? Well, let's talk about business at the office, Norman. Beautiful pool you have here. Beautiful. Oh, now let's talk about it here. Didn't they like me? Well, maybe the part wasn't just right. It was the best part of the year. Look, Oliver. You think I'm slipping? Can you take it? Yeah, go ahead. The tense is wrong. You're not slipping. You've slipped. Oh, my. My fan mail's still big. Norman, Norman. Fans will write to anybody for a photograph. It only costs three cents for a stamp, and that makes photographs cheaper than wallpaper. But every 25 cents they pay for a theater ticket buys them the right to be a critic. And your last few performances, Norman, have not pleased your critics. You remember I told you I'd uh, be ready for the curtains when the time came? Here it is. Let's call off the contract, no hard feelings. We're not quitting, either of us. There's no explaining these things. We've all seen how the public turns. Maybe we can turn them back. I've got a swell script lined up for you. About, about Esther. Uh, you think that I'm going to get in her way? Well, as a matter of fact, as it happens, there's no part in this story for her. I'd more or less plan to star her in a picture of her own. With, uh, with that young Pemberton opposite her. He's coming along nicely. Good for young Pemberton. All right, Oliver. We'll make a try at it. Let's hope it's not too late. Lester isn't home as yet. No, I'm not the butler. But I can take a message just as well as he can, honest. Oh, is that you, Norman? Swell. Listen, Norman, this is Artie Carver. Hiya, kid. Swell. Say, I hear you're through with Oliver Niles. Is that on the level? Oh, please, Artie, I'm not news anymore. Forget it. Say, what kind of a settlement did you make on your contract? Give me a figure so I can do a story on it. There was no money involved. We just called it quits. Okay, okay, I'll fill in my own figure. Say, by the way, I've been trying to get an interview with Vicky for two weeks, but she's always busy. How about you giving an old pal a break by speaking to her for me? Sure, I'll ask her. Swell. So long. <laughs> so little of you, I'd like to have you to myself. Oh, but it's a servant's night out. We haven't any. Yes, we have. I fixed a little snack with my own lily white hand. I, uh, am learning to cook in my spare time. Then I think I'll marry you. 
I get it. You want to make an honest cook of me? Comes in on wheels in this joint. Big enough. I'll, uh, I'll measure it next time and make them to size. A little hard to lift, too. <laughs> I think I think I'll take those measurements right now. Vicki Lester live here? Yes. I got a package for her. I'll sign for it. Well, who are you? I'm her husband. Oh, sure. I'm right here, Mr. Lester. you for a benefit to Shrine Auditorium next Wednesday night. I told them I'd ask you. And, uh... Oh, darling, uh, I don't want to hear about mm -hmm. that now. Well, you better wait till I finish before I forget them all. Uh, the Academy dinner secretary phoned. She wants to know if you want a table reserved for you. Uh, oh, yes, Artie Carver called and asked if I'd use my influence with you to get him an interview. I told him I'd try. That was all, I think. Oh, Norman. Yes, don't talk about those things now. We're forgetting the wonderful food you put in. Oh, I'm, I'm not very hungry now. I think I'll, uh, I'll fix me a little drink. Hmm? How nice that statue is going to look on your mantelpiece. Do you suppose anything's happened to him? But of course not. He's just been held up in traffic. You think about that statuette. And now we arrive at the climax of the annual dinner of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science. 
the highest award within our power to bestow. We have already applauded with our hearts as well as our hands, while awards have been given those gentlemen who during the past year have rendered distinguished service to the motion picture industry. We now pay honor to the ladies, or rather to one lady. We offer to her the Academy Award for the finest performance of the past year. She has already had the world's acclaim, but this is the tribute of our fellow workers, the men and women of this industry. It is not only my pleasure, but my privilege to present this award to the actress who created the unforgettable Anna in Dream Without End, Miss Vicki Lester. more can we say, Miss Lester? This says it all for us. Ladies and gentlemen, when something like this happens to you, and you try to tell how you feel about it, you find that out of all the words in the world, there are only two that really mean anything. Thank you. All I can do is to say them to you from my heart. All I can do is to keep on saying them. Hey, that's fine. All the same. That's a very pretty speech, my dear. Very pretty. You said the right thing. I want to be the very first one to congratulate you. I'll let you. On that valuable little piece of bric a brac. Now I want to make a speech. Gentlemen of the Academy and fellow suckers, I got one of those ones for a best performance. They don't mean a thing. People get them every year. But I want a special award, something nobody else can get. I want a statue for the worst performance of the year. In fact, I want three statues for the three worst performances of the year because I've earned them. And every single one of you that saw those last masterpieces of mine knows that I've earned them. Libby, start the music. What I'm here to find out is, do I get them or do I get them? Now answer, yes or no. Let's go and sit down. Come on, Norman, sit for that. That's for you, Norman. Hello, Norman. Hello, Norman, how are you? Hi, Norman. My dear, do let me congratulate you. You must be terribly proud and happy tonight. Thank you. Somebody give me a drink. My dressing room. Vicki, how are you? I've missed you. Everyone's missed you. Have a nice trip. Well, the three months tour of the theater circuit scarcely comes under the head of pleasure. But the way they're screaming for your pictures all over the country. Miss Lester, if I may talk sharp, you are a knockout. Thank you. It's good to hear that. You've been crying. A little. How's Norman? He's trying awfully hard, Oliver. Letting Norman leave this studio was the hardest thing I ever did. There was nothing else I could do. I knew. Has he been... Is he all right? He's gone to a sanitarium. He really wants to stop drinking. 
And I think he could only... Well, perhaps if he could start working again, there would be some encouragement. Oh, Oliver, could you? Could you do that? Oh, thank you. But he mustn't ever know I told you. He won't know. And you mustn't worry. I want you to keep up your good work in this picture. I'll try, Oliver. That's the one thing I can do for you. If you'll just sit here, Mr. Niles, I'll have Mr. Main brought down. Thank you. Brought down. Hello, Oliver. <laughs> Welcome to Liberty Hall. Hello, Norman. <laughs> well, no. No, oh, Mr. Niles isn't slipping me a case of scotch, Cuddles. This is just a handshake. <laughs> this is Cuddles, Oliver, my social secretary. We, we go everywhere together. <laughs> How are you feeling, Norman? Fine. Getting along remarkably well, Cuddles tells me. He says you ought to see some of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Let's sit down. Yeah. Cuddles, we, we really don't need you. Touching, isn't it? <laughs> Can't bear to have me out of his sight. Are you comfortable here, Norman? Comfortable. It's positively luxurious. They, they even have iron bars in the windows to keep out the draft. <laughs> How much longer are you going to be here? Oh, well, I'm really cured now. I'm just staying on for an extra week or two to get in good shape, you know? After all, there's no, no particular hurry to return to the camera. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I've got a script with a fine part for you in it. Yeah, you know, well, that's great. That's great. Who, uh, who plays opposite me? Well, it is not exactly the lead. Young Pemberton's doing that. But I tell you frankly, I consider your part better than the lead. Oh, I see. It's better than, than the lead. Well, of course, it isn't terribly long. But it's one of those parts that makes an impression on you. They'll be thinking about you all through the picture. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is, Oliver, I'm uh, pretty well set at another studio. I'm, I'm not at liberty at the moment to tell you which one. You know yourself how those things are. Yes, of course. But it's a big picture. It's one of the biggest of the year. Mm -hmm. And the part. Every actor in Hollywood would give his teeth to play. Mm -hmm. hey. Well, that's fine, Norman. Uh, naturally, that will tie you up for a while. But we won't get to this picture for some time. Perhaps, if you want to consider it for later on, we'll, we'll I'll be... Well, i tell you, Oliver, you'd better not count on me. See, uh, I've got several pictures lined up after this one, and they're talking to me about England. You know, they're, they're doing some very interesting things over there, you know? Mm -hmm. Hey. Uh, what is it, Cuddle? Speak right out. We all love you. Good dinner. Oh, <laughs> here we dine at 5.30 here. Mm -hmm. it makes the nights longer. <laughs> well, goodbye, Norman. I'm glad to see you getting along so well. Be out in no time. I'll have to introduce myself all over to a lot of people. They <laughs> won't know me when I'm not drinking. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye, Norman. Thanks for dropping in. Yeah. Well, Cuddles? Alone at last, eh? to run into these has-beens. Give me the creeps. Me too. He was good while he had it. And he had it quite a while. Hello. Hello, Mr. Main. I haven't seen you in a long time. Oh, I've been resting. Ginger ale, please. 
Ginger ale and what? Ginger ale and, and ginger ale. A new leaf? A whole new book. Thank you. Scotch straight. Hello, Libby. Why, it's Mr. America of yesteryear. Do they let you wander about now without a keeper? Oh, sure. I, I'm, a, I'm a trustee now. Didn't expect to find you at Santa Anita. What do they do with the actors while, while you're away? Oh, they cut them into slices and fry them with eggs. I suppose you'll be here all the time, now that you've retired from the hurly-burly of the silver screen. Well, we're living down in Malibu now, and pretty lonesome with Esther away working all day. Well, I wouldn't squawk about that if I were you. It's nice to have somebody in the family making a living. Oh, wait a minute, Louie. I don't want to forget that we're friends. Friends, my eye. Say, listen, I got you out of jams because I had to. It was my job, not because I was your friend. I don't like you, and I never have liked you. Nothing made me happier than to see all those cute little pranks of yours finally catch up with you and land you on your celebrated face. Pretty work, Billy. Always wait till they're down, then kick them. I don't feel sorry for you. You fixed yourself nice and comfortable. You can live off your wife now. She'll buy you drinks and put up with you even though nobody else will. I'm Norman Maine. Oh, that's not my fault. Oh, I don't bother to toss him out. He's harmless. All right, Mr. Levy, if you say so. Sure, let him go. What can he do? He can't fight any better than he can act. Norman Maine. Oh, he's drunk again. Why, he's been drunk for years. Norman Maine. Norman Maine. Norman Maine. Double. Leave the bottle here. Vicky, you'll be ill. Why don't you try to get a little sleep? But he's been gone four days. Four days and not a word. Oliver, I can't. This is Oliver Nile speaking. What? Where? Thank you. What is it? Nothing, what? nothing. Oliver, tell me. He's in the night court. He's been arrested on a drunk charge. Now, he's all right. He isn't hurt. I'm going right down and get him out. I'm going with you. Vicky, it isn't any place for you. And if it gets in the papers... What do I care about the papers? I'm going with you. Mr. Court, County Los Angeles, now in session. The Honorable George J. Paris presiding. Be seated, please. Was he able to do anything? The judge wouldn't even see me. Ready, Your Honor. I want to advise you that you're entitled to be represented by counsel, to be confronted by the witnesses that may testify against you, to compel witnesses to attend on your behalf to a public and speedy trial by the court or by a jury, and the right to be admitted to bail. Call the first five. Gregory, Payne, Payne, Rodriguez, come. Come on, boys, get over here. Go ahead. Move along. William Gregory. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Rain drunk, picked up at Fifth in town. Asleep in the gutter. Fourteen similar offenses in the past six months. Still that in Gregory. How do you plead? Uh, I don't feel so bad. I'll ask you how you feel. I'll ask you how you plead. Guilty, I guess. When did you get out the last time? Uh, just, just before Christmas. Well, I'm sorry you'll have to miss New Year's. You'll be out in time for Washington's birthday in 60 days. Milton Rails. A plain drunk, picked up on Brooklyn Avenue, given treatment at receiving hospital, then removed to jail. How old are you, Rails? Uh, 17, sir. Did you take a good look at those men in the cell with you last night? Yes, sir. And have you taken a good look at yourself this morning? Oh, no, sir. Well, I suggest that you do. Five dollars or two days. 
Sentence suspended. Oh, Judge. I... Alfred Henkel, more commonly known as Norman Maine. Uh, drunk and disorderly. Crack car into tree at sunset in Coronado. Evidently been drinking for days. Resisted arrest and injured one of the arresting officers. How do you plead? Guilty. You're Norman Maine, the actor, aren't you? You've come pretty low, haven't you? There isn't a man here who's had the advantages you've had. Look what you've done with them. You're nothing but an irresponsible drunk, driving about the streets with the power to inflict death or injury on innocent people. I think we'd better deny you that power for a while. 90 days in the city jail. Please wait. I'm his wife. Yes, I recognize you, Miss Lester. Please, Judge. I promise you this won't happen again. I'll be responsible for him. If you just won't send him there. You realize that this man, when drunk, is obviously a menace to public safety? And you realize, too, Miss Lester, the responsibility you'll be assuming to this court and to the Commonwealth. I do. Sentence suspended. Prisoner remanded to custody of wife. Thank you. You can get in at the jail entrance, madam. Jose Rodriguez. Main drunk, picked up at first in Maine, second offense. How do you plead? I think I'm guilty, Your Honor. 60 days. you're giving up the game. So I can try to give Norman back his. Can you honestly tell me I'm wrong to do it? No, Vicky. I can't honestly tell you that. Then there'll be no more. Vicky Lester. Goodbye, Vicki Lester. You were a grand girl. Good luck, Mrs. Norman Maine.
calling him. This is Maine coming in to apologize again. Uh, I'm sorry, dear, but it, it isn't you. What other troubles have you got? None. I was just playing a scene with myself. Now look. I'm just coming out of the jitters, and you're just going into them. This is a swell household. Isn't it? I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll promise to brace up if you'll go on the wagon. <laughs> I guess I have been drinking too much. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be an athlete. You mean with great big muscles and everything? Well, roughly speaking. Good. Join the YMCA? Uh, it costs too much. I'm going waiting out in our front yard. Now? Sure. Would you like me to go with you? Sure, if you'd like to. No, I mean, I don't think I will. It might spoil this beautiful, natural way. Yeah, I guess that's right. But, darling, look, uh, could you have a hot toddy uh, and some hot soup for me when I come back? Some hot soup? And, and I'll make some of those nice sandwiches. No, do you have to? <laughs> <laughs> I take just one more look. Congratulations to the Pacific Ocean. Paychecks for the servants, Graves. You'll find a very nice bonus in each one. 
Miss Nestor asked me to thank you for your kindness and service. If there's anything I can do for this little lady, I should be glad to do it. She would appreciate your attending to the closing of the Beverly Hills house. Put down those trunks. Put it down, I say. Well, where is she? In the bedroom. Who are you? I'm her grandmother. Get up. Granny, darling. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. What made you come? Oh, I know when I'm needed. Now, get out of here. Go on. Get out of here, all of you. I want to talk to my granddaughter alone. I came just as quickly as I could. But I'm going home. I sent you a wire yesterday. Hmm. Is it true that you're going to quit the movie? I never want to hear them again. What are you running away from, little girl? I'm not running away. It's just that I can't go on. My heart isn't in it anymore. Once I told you, if you get what you want, you have to give your heart in exchange. And you said you were willing. Do you remember? I remember. It seems to me that you've got more than you bargained for. More fame, more success, even more personal happiness. Maybe more unhappiness. But you did make a bargain. And now you're whining over it. I don't think I'd feel so very proud of myself if I were you, Esther. I'm not granny. My mind's made up. Oh, and I'm sorry I gave you the money to come out here. It's just waste. Oh, but granny, I was proud of you, Esther. I was proud to be the grandmother of Vicky Lester. It gave me something to live for. Now, I have been. I know. Oh, I want to be strong, but I, I can't go on. <laughs> you must. Tragedy is a test of courage. If you can meet it bravely, it will leave you bigger than it found you. If not, then you'll have to live all your life as a coward. Because no matter where you may run, you can never run away from yourself. I never knew Norman Maine. He wrote me a very sweet letter when you were married. He said you told him how much I meant to you. And I know just how much you must have meant to him. You know, Esther, I can't believe that wherever he is, he can be very happy knowing that his death broke the spirit of the little girl he praised me so highly for raising. And I can't believe that he can be very proud, knowing that all his great love did for you was to make you a quitter. The car is ready, Miss Lester. We'll have to go now to make the train. <laughs> The entire fiction industry has come to the Chinese theater for this opening tonight. It has come to pay tribute to a great star on her long-awaited return to the screen in what has been called her greatest performance. It has come to pay tribute to the girl herself, the girl who has won the heart of Hollywood, the girl who has won the heart of the world, Miss Vicki Lester. And if I'm not mistaken, Miss Lester's car has just driven up. Yes, it is she. I scare very slowly, young man. Just a while, folks, please. They'll have your mug. I mean, your face plastered across half the papers in the country tomorrow. Hmm. How do I look? Oh, you look slow. You're a liar, but I like you. And here's Miss Lester's grandma. Won't you say a few words to the radio audience, please? Say something, Letty. You know, we've got a thing like that back home where they all listen in on, but we call it a party line. <laughs> Won't you say something, please? They're listening. Maybe some of you people listening in dream about coming to Hollywood. 
maybe some of you get pretty discouraged. Well, when you do, you just think about me. It took me over 70, 60 years to get here, but here I am, and here I mean to stay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Miss Lester. This microphone is on an international hookup. Throughout the world, your fans are hoping that you'll say a few words to them. Hello, everybody. This is Mrs. Norman Maine. Hi, I'm Rob Disman, and I'm the owner of your local Domino's Slippery Rock. I started out with Domino's as a delivery driver when I was in college, ended up really liking the job, worked my way up through management to the supervisor. I did that for about 10 years. My family, we decided that we couldn't really go any further with that, so we decided to go ahead and become a franchisee with Domino's. I'm lucky enough to have enough community support that most customers have become more than just customers, they're more like friends. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this community for 20 years, and I look forward to many more years. Welcome back. So James, what did you think of the movie? Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I think this is not my favorite iteration. My favorite iteration is probably the one with Barbara Streisand. Okay. And then I would put this one second. Um, and as I said, I'm not a huge fan of the newest one. But uh, this, is, th this is a very good iteration. And I'm glad that we chose this for this week. Yeah, I really liked it. I've only seen... Um, I saw the the newest one first, yeah. and then I went back and watched this one. Yeah. I was surprised how similar they were. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Like, they really kept the story intact for the most part. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of times for remakes, you know, you find that they, uh, they'll they change major aspects of the story. Uh, but for for the most part, for Star is Born, uh, they have kept the core story uh, exactly the same in all four iterations. Yeah. Uh, except with, you know, Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. They weren't film stars. You know, they were singers. Um, you know, just something about this film that I think kind of sets it apart um, in a category of its own. This is actually the first uh, Technicolor film um, to be nominated for uh, the Best Film oh, really? uh, Academy Award. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's It's also known as the first, you know, all fi all color film actually to be a, bu uh, a, a an actual hit you know up until this point color films i mean yeah they did well but they weren't as successful as some of their black and white predecessors uh and mainly because that's what you know people knew um but this was the first uh, all color hit uh film um which again i just think sets it apart on yeah. all on its own i mean i can see why um I really like kind of like the tone of the movie because they, like it's funny. They tell a lot of jokes in the movie, but also it does kind of have like the sad undertones and obviously the ending is, is pretty. Yeah, pretty yeah. Sad, so. um, well, and that goes back to Frederick, Mar uh, Frederick March and Janet Gaynor. I mean, just having a great chemistry mm -hmm. on, on film uh, that to me, I mean, they do come off as an actual married couple. And actually incorrectly, I for whatever reason, thought Frederick March and Janet Gaynor were actually married. It, it, that wasn't the case. I went into this movie, uh, you know, <laughs> thinking that fact was true, um, mm -hmm. which is why I was surprised at the end uh, when I went and looked at, you know, behind the scenes that I, I was wrong. But in the film, I mean, they have such good chemistry that you could see Frederick March and Janet Gaynor being an actual married couple. Yeah. Um, but that's that's just my my opinion, uh, you know, obviously. So. I feel like whenever I watch some of, like, the old, like, kind of older movies it's like nah, the chemistry's like kind of there but like i see what they were going for but for this one specifically i really i really did enjoy their like relationship um 
which is really important to get, I guess, for this story because you can't really be sad. Oh yeah. If you don't think that they were a good fit in the first place. Oh so. yeah, yeah, and you know, the, as, you know, the performance of Frederick March in this film. Um, and he, talking just about the end, uh, you know, when he walks off, you know, into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, you really feel it. I mean, you know, it, it, it it's an upsetting ending to the movie because you want to root for, you know, you want to root for him. Like, you want to see him come back on top. You want to see his career restarted. And, you know, at the same time, like, you understand kind of the the the, the growing rift between you know, he and his wife, you know, because he thought that, you know, they were going to come on top together. And obviously she starts gaining more traction uh, with her career, um, you know, wins the Oscar uh, mm -hmm. for her performance. And just a fun fact about that, uh, the Oscar that she receives in the movie was actually Janet Gaynor's own Academy oh, really? Award that she had won in real life. They used that as the prop. That's actually really cool. Yeah. So, yeah, but ba getting back on point, I mean, you know, you you can almost relate to the feelings in the film, um, you know, because we've all been in a point in our lives where maybe we are questioning, you know, decisions that we made um, in relationships. I mean, there are those, you know, rifts where, you know, you do start to maybe seem overshadowed by your significant other, depending on, you know, where you are, you know, in your life and, you know, how successful or, whatever their, you know, their life is turning to. So, yeah, I just think that was a major aspect of the film. So, uh, I know you mentioned the, the Oscar, which is cool. Uh, you got any other fun facts from well, behind the scenes? Yeah, so, uh, and this kind of goes with what we were talking about with the chemistry and the feeling that they were an actual married couple. The film has always rumored to have been about Barbara Stanwyck, uh, who is a, a very fine actress, and her first husband. Mm -hmm. And that it was written specifically, you know, uh, about them. So I think that's where a lot of, like, that realistic feeling to that relationship comes from. Because mm -hmm. it's not somebody sitting in an office and coming up with this fictional story. Uh, it's, you know, based on actual uh, people. Uh, now, obviously, some things were changed. But uh, I, I just think that really helps the movie. Yeah. Which is why I'm a, a, a very big fan of, uh, of films that are about actual events and actual people. I mean, it feels um, more natural that way. So. Oh yeah, no, it it absolutely does. Uh, it, there's uh, you know so many films that I could name where they're about actual people that I just think deserved more accolades than you know what they wound up getting yeah. because to me it's you can actually uh, re relate even more. I mean, I, obviously you can relate to a, a fictional film as well, but uh, when it's about an actual person, especially someone that uh, you've heard about, you know, whether they be historical or, you know, celebrity, stuff like that, um, I just feel like you kind of relate to them a little bit more because it's like they're not just celebrities at this point. They're not just somebody on the screen. They're they're actual human, you know. You, mm -hmm. you, you see that side to them, you know, it's... You know, I think we idolize celebrities in a way where, you know, they, you know they're like God sort of thing. Like, um, but f for some of these stories, and, you know, especially when they do these films, uh, you start to see their, their, you know, their everyday side. Their, their humanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just think, you know, for, for the 1937 uh, iteration and comparing it to the 2019 Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper and I'm going to use that one because it's more relevant and yeah. more people have probably seen it. Um, but comparing those two together, I, I have to, you know, just point out the differences between Bradley Cooper and, you know, Frederick March, you know, in between the two films. Uh, you know, Bradley Cooper, you know, who's a great actor, by the way, I like, oh, yeah. Brad, I like Bradley Cooper a lot. Uh, he comes off more gr gruff yeah. and... Uh, I guess in a way you could say it, it's more realistic in the 2019 film because they don't hold back. I mean, they show that side of alcohol, you know, alcoholism mm -hmm. uh, in a very realistic way. Because um, in, the, in the 1937 version, he kind of has that moment at the awards where he has his, his outburst. But in the newer one, it's kind of like you can, you can almost kind of feel that run through the whole movie. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, 
And I think, you know, I think that's one aspect of the newer version that really holds uh, weight is yeah. that you it's a realistic side to it. And, you know, they didn't really show stuff like that back uh, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. I yeah. mean, there were certain things that were not shown in films or on television because, you know, they were considered uh, too taboo. And, you know, showing somebody, you know, in that manner was a little bit too taboo. They didn't think that people wanted to come to the movies and see that, especially in the 30s. I mean, you're talking about it's, you know, the decade of, the you know, when the Great Depression happened mm -hmm. and people were going through, you know, such turmoil in their lives that many people were turning to alcohol. And, you know, the movies were supposed to be an escape or are still supposed to be an escape from your everyday life so that you don't have to think about things like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so in the, our version that we watched, you know, you don't see um, you don't see things pushed to the envelope like you do today um, and then bouncing back to the 2019 film like it was in that in that movie. Yeah. But I, I still think showing, you know, the alcoholism and stuff in a story that old, like. Still pretty impressive just because, like you said, movies weren't really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like that. And Frederick March's performance in that outburst scene I mean, that's all you really have to see. I mean, if you want to, if you want to get a good idea of Frederick March as an actor, you really just want to go back and watch that scene alone because he does a phenomenal job uh, in that in that yeah, in that moment. Uh, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, and I, there are movies where, you know, uh, there are many movies where I just start to feel that cringy Ugh. sensation, yeah. and I will have to like look away from the TV because it's just. It's too much. Yeah. Um, and I know exactly what you mean. I mean, you know, I would not have wanted to be in the room you know, dur during that scene. I mean, it would just be very uncomfortable yeah, to me. Yeah, it's funny. As I was watching the movie, my roommate came in during that scene. Yes. She was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's hard to watch things like that, yeah. um, which is why, I mean, I, I would try to, I try to imagine what audiences from the 30s, how they would react to movies and TV now. I mean, oh, especially yeah. TV. I mean, you know, you think of like shows like NCIS and CSI, the graphic uh, violence they show on TV now versus, and those you know. shows are pretty standard. Right. You didn't even see any type of blood, you know, back in the 30s and 40s. And, yeah. you know, films were had a little bit more leeway. But even films, you know, gangster films, people getting shot or whatever, there wasn't, you know, gory scenes that went with that. Uh, you know, it was they would just fall over and that would be it. So, you know, even stuff like that was considered too far for, for film and television. Um, and, you know, I just want to go back to uh, we were talking about uh, the Academy Awards and, you know, a scene in the film. But um, just to, you know, switch to you know, real life for a second. Uh, Janet Gaynor and Frederick March uh, were the only two actor and actress from the same film nominated in Best Actor and Best Actress at oh, really? the Academy Awards for their performance. Uh, now, today we see that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, three billboards from Ebbing County comes to mind um, for most recently. I'm sure there was another one that was more recent than that, but that one came to mind first. Uh, we see that a lot now, but, uh, you know, back then it was it, uh, rare when you had a uh, an actress and an actor from one singular movie both get nominated at the uh, Academy Awards. Yeah, that's really cool. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, and again, well deserving. Yeah. Uh, well deserving. I, th I want to say uh, for the 2019 version, you know, Bradley Cooper was either snubbed in the Best Actor or Best Director category, one of them. Which again, I, I'm not a fan of that film, but blows my mind because I mean, it it was. I mean, it is a star is born. It's still I mean, the same, same bones, right, same story. Right, and he is, you know, a great actor. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, rightfully so, Frederick Mar March and Janet Gaynor, and you know, as our viewers just watched, I mean, they they definitely deserved um, nominations for their performance. Oh, absolutely. Um, so before you know, wrapping up, uh, is there uh, anything specific you wanted to uh, to point out from from your viewing? Um, anything specific? I mean, I guess all in all, after watching the newest one and the oldest one, yeah, um, I think I might like the older one better. I know you obviously like the older one better, but um, 
I yeah, I, I, uh, I just, I'm very big into old films. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up with my grandmother, so I mean, TCM is in our on our I'm very TV. Much the other way around. So yeah, I'm now branching out. Yeah, no, uh, TCM was on our our TV all the time, uh, which is how I got really big into uh, Spencer Tracy and you know Catherine Hepburn films. Uh, so I do tend to gravitate to older films mm -hmm. um, a, a lot more. Uh, in fact, a lot of the films I have at home are, are, are mostly older. Uh, so that's probably a bias there that I have yeah. uh, for movies. But I would say, you know, for the most part, I mean, there are just movies that I think people write off because they're black and white or mm -hmm. because you know, they're from the 30s or 40s, and they're just like, oh, well, that movie, you know, it's too old. I don't want to watch that. Like, I want to watch something new. But there are so many movies from that era that really do ignite, you know, uh, I, I, you know, putting into words like a feeling within you uh, that I don't think they, they, that they realize. I mean, yeah. you know, some of the greatest moments in cinematic history you know, happened in the early 20th, you know, century um, Hollywood era. I feel like a lot of the time, whenever I go back and watch an older movie, I gotta get surprised for some reason. I'm like, oh, this is actually really good. I'm like, of course it's good. It's a classic for a reason. Hi, I'm Rob Disman, and I'm the owner of your local Domino's Slippery Rock. I started out with Domino's as a delivery driver when I was in college. Ended up really liking the job. Worked my way up through management to the supervisor. I did that for about 10 years. My family, we decided that we couldn't really go any further with that, so we decided to go ahead and become a franchisee with Domino's. I'm lucky enough to have enough community support that most customers have become more than just customers, they're more like friends. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this community for 20 years, and I look forward to many more years. You know, and I, actually, I think last year I, I had a debate with somebody in uh, my uh, film analysis class, and uh, we talked about the movie 12 Angry Men, and, That's a great movie. Uh, it is a great movie. And they said it was kind of boring because it's just the 12 of them sitting in the juror room, for the most part, mm -hmm. debating this case. That's why it's so good. And that's why it's so good because uh, you have Henry Fonda uh, as the lead uh, juror. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, just his performance in that film, and I forget the other gentleman's name, the, the standout. The, the holdout juror uh, from the film. I can't remember the actor's name. But the two of them are so good at their craft that they captivate you with just a back and forth between the two of them. There didn't have to be action. You didn't have to watch the trial scenes. You know, you didn't need to... I think they may show the murder at the beginning of the film, if I remember correctly. For like a second. But you didn't need to see that because Henry Fonda was able to carry that entire movie just sitting in a room with, you know, 11 other people uh, talking about a case. Uh, and that's, again, that's an older film there that, you know, this kid also thought was kind of boring, but that's an older film where, you know, you have these actors who were so mesmerizing that they pulled you in uh, just by the way they talked, you know, the, their facial expressions, their mannerisms. I mean, everything kind of drew you to the screen. So, uh, yeah, I, I am a fan of older films. Um, so I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Uh, you know, sorry, Aaron and I got uh, got into it a little here, but uh, hopefully you guys learned something about the film. Uh, join us next week when we watch another new exciting film. Uh, Aaron, it was a pleasure. And As always. Yes. You guys have a great day.